And um, I was also um, interested in other aspects of diversity in philosophy as well. And, I, and this will take me actually straight into talking about the, or having you talk about the a critical thinking project, I, I think as well, because to me, that's been one of the great uh, broader diversifiers um, in the uh, little toolbox that I think you've developed over the last 10 plus years at UQ. So maybe um, we could use that uh, segue into as an opportunity to start talking about that. And then we'll come back and talk a bit more about history of modern. Okay. Uh, yeah, so, so the Critical Thinking Project at, um, at the University of Queensland, it's, it's really largely a teaching for thinking project. So one of the things that we, we want to do is to, to get more philosophy and critical thinking into the schools. Um, there is a uh, philosophy and reason subject, which is a senior subject uh, at, you know, in Queensland schools. It's been adopted by about 30 schools. And a lot of the, a lot of the schools are actually recognising the value of that of that course, um, not just in terms of improving uh, students' academic performance, which certainly does, and there's lots of data on that, but also on its, um, its building these, you know, these virtues of good inquirers. Um, so resilience, open-mindedness, and, you know, really virtues that are important to citizenship as well. So a lot of the schools that, you know, have introduced philosophy and reason as a senior subject have now pushed it back and now offering it all the way through to to grade seven. Um, so that's been, you know, a hugely important thing. Um, the other thing we started to do was to, uh, to work with the Queensland Government Department of, in of Education's Impact Centre, um, at which CARA is employed, uh, to develop uh, critical thinking courses um, to be delivered online to students all over the state of Queensland. And we've had over 350 schools participate in that critical thinking series with students from as young as grades four all the way through to grade 10. And the, you know, again, the data on, um, on that is that, you know, in terms of students' uh, educational gains, their improved performance on NAPLAN and also on the A to E data um, is, you know, is, is quite clear that that's a real game changer for a lot of students. And, and the fact that it's available to students all over Queensland, including very remote, and remote communities, so communities way up in the Torres Strait, um, are you know Tag Eye College students there doing their critical thinking. I love this image of students on Saibai, which is a little island from which you can walk to Papua New Guinea at low tide with their headphones on, learning critical thinking uh, from a UQ Impact Centre developed course. Um, I love that idea. I love the fact that this you know group of eight university prestigious university in Brisbane can be outreaching um, these very remote co communities. Uh, and we also um, worked with the Department of Education to develop a program specifically for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students, which is called Solid Pathways, which is still going strong. Uh, again, students learning all about critical thinking and, um, and applying it to different areas of the curriculum. And that course, that, that program, which has about 500 to 800 um, uh, students in it in any given year, is, uh, is a real game changer and has really um, kind of kept a lot of those students on track uh, to any career that they, that they might be interested in. Um, and that, you know, those kinds of areas, particularly, um, you know, engaging more Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander students in philosophy uh, is one of our goals in our project. And we also work, we also develop courses for um, low SES students. And again, the data on that is pretty impressive. Uh, we're seeing higher retention and completion rates and higher GPAs, actually higher GPAs than the university average. And I think it's empowering to give students a voice, give them the opportunity to express their voice uh, and, and, um, and also to give them the tools to, you know, to develop a reasoned position and articulate it well. I mean, those, those skills are absolutely uh, important academically, socially and in every other way. But the point I was going to make about the, the, pro, the, the course that we have for low SES and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students um, is, that, is what, in terms of students' results once they transition to UQ, it's showing not only does it help create a level playing field, it actually boosts performance relative to the, the average at UQ. So it's, it's actually helping these students to perform better than the average. So we're really very proud of all that. Uh, and finally, the other work we do is, is around a, what we call a teaching for thinking pedagogy, um, which has been developed by my very clever colleague, um, Dr. Peter Ellerton, 
and um, and Cara is one of our uh, you know facilitators uh, yeah. in that project too. So we're also working with schools to kind of uh, embed philosophy and critical thinking across the curriculum, not just in terms of standalone courses. Yeah, so I'm really interested to follow up on um, how you think this kind of works. I have a question about that. So what I want to do is I want to follow up on exactly this. Like the basic question is, uh, um, yep, I'm completely on board, of course, with all of this <laughs> diversifying of philosophy and equipping, you know, um, the next generation of minds with as much sort of, uh, uh, in some sense, firepower and equipment they need for all walks of life. Um, and it looks like philosophy is doing that. Um, and I'm kind of, kind of curious, how, you know, why does philosophy do that? Or how, how does it do it? Like, I mean, you sort of, and this might bring us back to talk about effectiveness and emotions in philosophy. And uh, I have certain kinds of views. I have, a, I have a dog in this fight, I guess, but I'm curious, you know, how you think it, it works? Is it just that people learn rules for thinking and they apply them? Um, or what else goes on with, with that process? Right, I mean, that's, that's a really uh, interesting question. Um, and uh, I, think, I think that what we have to do is, um, you know, I've spent a lot of time, you know, looking at cognitive biases that psychologists talk a lot about, you know. And, and one of the most per pernicious kinds of biases is belief perseverance, right? That our, this kind of inertia that we have. And, you know, there are these wonderful, bizarre experiments that they do, which just show how deeply entrenched our, our prior beliefs can, can be. Um, you know, so for example, if, when we're challenged, you know, we're, we're more, our beliefs are more likely to become more entrenched rather than less. <laughs> um, you know, and then just all the ways in which our thinking is framed, right? The more we, the more we hear something, uh, the more often we hear something, the more likely we are to believe it, right? Um, and then there's a million, there's kind of a gazillion of these, you know, cognitive biases that that we're that we're prone to, um, and you know, you know, a lot of a lot of education, um, in so far as it's it's been focused on the importance of having critical thinking uh, in the classroom, has tended has tended to focus on these you know logical rules or tips and tricks. You know, like if you just teach students the fallacies, you know, then they'll be able to transfer that you know across you know, various domains of their, their learning across the curriculum and so on. And, and it just, it just, it just doesn't work like that. Um, you, I mean, what, what we have to, we have to also include a value dimension, right? So we, we have to engage students in, um, they have to not only sort of, in a sense, be able to apply these rules and, you know, detect validity and question the truth of premises and so on. They, they need to do that in a way that's aligned to what we call in our project values of inquiry. Right. So, you know, so can you perform an analysis with respect to clarity, you know, depth, breadth, um, precision, relevance, accuracy, uh, cogency, you know. Um, and, and when you get students sort of performing these cognitive tasks like analysis, inference, justification, evaluation, synthesis, whatever it might be, when you get them doing that with a view, you know, in, in a way that directs them to these values of inquiry, uh, then they're able to reflect on the quality of their own thinking and that of others. So then it becomes this normative exercise around, you know, um, what, what, does, what does quality thinking look like, right? How can I make, you know, how can I make my thinking clearer, right? Um, uh, you know, I mean, I've got this, is, is my evidence relevant? Um, well, if it's relevant, but is it significant? And you start to get students playing with these, with these values of inquiry. And when you're in that space, then they can start to develop what we call these virtues of inquiry, things like open-mindedness, resilience, integrity, persistence. They can use the principle of charity. And, and that's, that's really taking it beyond this sort of purely intellectual application of rules, and in fact, we know from also from psychological studies that that if you if you teach that if you teach any domain um, in a very any domain of inquiry, any discipline in a very procedural way, then then students will get hung up on on the procedures, on the formulae, and uh, in a way that will actually conflict with their producing the best outcome. So there are these classic examples where where um, even student, even people with PhDs were given, uh, given a formula and told to measure the volume of a sphere. And um, so they you know, applied the formula, they got a result and so on. 
And when they were then sort of asked to sort of pour water into the sphere and then pour it out again into a measuring device and, you know, the measurement they got conflicted with what they got from the formula. And they, and about all but one of these, you know, subjects in this one particular study I was looking at, you know, stuck with, stuck with the formula, right? Only one of them said, oh, you know, they prefer to go with their actual measurements as if, and this is a bit like, it's a bit like the example that Sextus is talking about in the case of Diodorus Cronus, you know, sort of sticking to his theory, <laughs> despite the fact that, you know, it's not going to get his shoulder relocated, right? Um, so, so we can get overly attached to rules and formulae and, and sort of lose, you know, lose in a sense the point um, of those form of, of that kind of those kinds of rules. And you know, you just get this uncritical acceptance of these things. And we need to always be, be critically questioning. Um, and that's, you know, that's true even as we know in logic as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting, interesting, interesting. 